thanks for joining the Rose Thunberg Working Group today. Um, it's been a while at the summer break. Um, for those who are joining us for the first time, my name is Maria Merlan. I work in Proxima with Pablo Garrido. Uh, he's a technical manager of MicroRoads, and together we are hosting this Rose 2 Working Group meetings. So let's start. Um, I'm going to share with you in the chat the agenda of the meeting today. And I will share my screen. OK, so today we are um, having uh, three main topics. Um, we have a, a couple of invited speakers from Capgemini Engineering, Rui Miguel Santos and Diana Teixeira. Um, they will be presenting their projects, which are both based on drone technology and combined ROS2 and micro ROS actually. Uh, there will be some time at the end of the presentation for questions and answers. Um, then in the second part of the session, we will pick up a panel discussion that actually this panel discussion was kicked off in our last meeting in July. And we are doing a follow up today with uh, Jan uh, from, from Bosch. And this is about providing a CPP API for MicroRoS, and also uh, Jan is bringing this ROS2 support for Rust uh, topic. Um, this session will be managed by Jan Statulat or Ral, actually, from Bosch, who is uh, here with us today. And they will be explaining the, the objective, the purpose of this panel discussion. I encourage you all to uh, participate in this panel. And to finish, um, if we have some time left, uh, Pablo uh, will present the latest enhancements regarding embedded development. And he will focus on several topics like the new Azure RTOS integration or the RCLC Action API, um, among other interesting topics. And finally, if any of the attendees wish to treat any further topic, please add them into the miscellaneous section uh, of the document. Um, we, they will be discussed at the end of the meeting. So I want to thank the participants from Capgemini Engineering uh, Altran from Lisbon, Portugal. Obrigada. Uh, thank you also, Bosch, uh, for bringing us insights today related to embedded applications. So uh, I think we can start with the agenda. Let's check if Rui and Diana uh, from Capgemini, are you ready? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, we, we appreciate the invite. And uh, if, uh, if you are okay with it, we can start the presentation. Okay, so Rui, you are starting. Uh, you are the first one presenting, right? Yes, uh, I'll just pass the word really quickly to my to my colleague Mateus to just give a presentation about our group, a quick quick thing, and then we'll uh, go on to the projects and show some cool stuff. Okay, well, thank you. I will stop sharing my screen. Okay, so I'm going to share now. Uh, mm -mm. Please tell me if you can uh, see it. Can yes. you see? Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah. I'll pass the word to Mateusz now. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Hui. So Hui is sharing the screen, but I will do the, the first talk. Thank you guys for, for having us today. Uh, we are part of the R&D uh, sector of Capgemini Engineering in, in Portugal. And today we're going to present you some of our, our projects that uh, are using MicroRoS and ROS2. 
uh, first I, I have this this agenda I will give only the the introduction to the projects and what we are doing here and then Hui will talk about his project and Diana about hers and then I will finish the presentation with our future work and some some papers that we have published and things that we have done okay so we start with the introduction okay, please yes okay <laughs> so we are we are part of the autonomous systems uh, team and here we basically do research on on these topics that uh, we have on the presentation uh, drones cars and the user control interfaces uh, with drones we have uh, projects with indoor drones that's the i will talk about the, the drones that we use on the next slide and also we are going to start some some development on outdoor drones uh, right now uh, our projects try to to use ROS and uh, and micro ROS for the development and some of the projects are are done with uh, collaboration with universities so they are based on master thesis projects so uh, everyone that that join us some of us actually uh, came from the university to do their master thesis and then they stay to do research here with with us you can change who please so uh, about the hardware that we are using on the on the projects that are, that use microbus is the the crazy fly that's a, a, a micro drone and uh, it has a stm32 for the for the microcontroller it has also a, a radio ship for communication for at 2.4 gigahertz so it's a just a wi-fi of the two and it has a, a not so much of RAM, so we have to to take care for what we put inside the drone, because uh, actually with it we have the autopilot the, that came from from the from the company that uh, manufactured this drone, Bitgrace, uh, guys from from Sweden, and. Uh, what we we are doing actually is to make the the interface that the apps that to, that Microbus uh, has to to control this drone. So we have some service to to make takeoff, to land, and everything. But we will talk about it on a, on, a, on a few minutes. Uh, more of this drone. This drone also has an IMU for with an accelerometer and a gyroscope. And it has also some some additional hardware, additional sensors, uh, a flow deck. It measures it, its velocity on the uh, on the environment, and it attached it to it. On board it, we have uh, the LDPS, the local position assistant. That's basically the uh, assistant that takes the, its position on the on the environment that we have on our our arena. Uh, and uh, we we did uh, uh, a, a custom a custom sensor for it that you can see on the on the image. It's a, a sensor for uh, air quality measurement, and uh, we will talk about it uh, more in a, in a few minutes. But this the sensor take uh, measurements of uh, the air quality in, in the environment, basically. And the, this deck is the deck to to work with. Uh, with the crazyfy was was kindly provided by by a, a researcher, the professor Patrick Nilma. And basically, that's it. That's our our hardware. I think we can can pass the slide, please. Okay. Yes, and then I, I pass the word to him. Uh, okay. Okay. So I'll. We cannot hear you, Rui. Okay, so, sorry. Uh, let me just go back. Okay, so uh, I'm going to present uh, the first use case that uses micro ROS slash ROS to here at Capgemini. Uh, as you could probably already tell from the hardware description, we have mounted a, an indoor air quality sensor on top of the drone. Uh, and the, the purpose of this, uh, of this project is to, to, to do airborne me sensor measurements using the drones. 
our purpose at this stage of the project is not properly to uh, to to get accurate measurements but to increase the interoperability of having a, an embedded robotic uh, robotic uh, platform in iot systems because we believe it, it's uh, sometimes it's cumbersome and difficult to integrate the, this two okay so here we have a, a system concept diagram uh, at the bottom we have the drones the drones are connected to a ground station here that is running the micro ROS agent uh, that, uh, as, as we know, uh, acts on behalf of the drones into the, the DDS data space that is represented by this data bus. This data bus is the core that we believe uh, improves the interoperability of our systems as the all, all, all the entities that, that uh, participate in this use case communicate through it either by ROS2 or micro ROS. Uh, aside from the, the maps, we also have some uh, ground sensors that provide um, sensor measurements that can improve the accuracy of the measurements of the drones, namely the, the sensor that we use have a, a humidity compensation feature. Uh, and that is, uh, I will talk more about this later, but we can uh, get a subscriber on the drone side that uh, Subscribes the the publish the the the, the publishes from the, the ground sensors and then does that uh, that compensation. Aside from that, we also have some GUIs to to facilitate the uh, yeah. planning missions and doing some basic uh, commands, as well as integration with uh, a, a cloud layer that is done with using the Iprozima or Iprozima <laughs> uh, integration service. Uh, we have a uh, uh, local data space here, and then we have a, a I call it the cloud data space, DDS data space on the on the cloud. Okay, so breaking down these systems, we have four main entities that are part of this use case. We have the drones. The drones are equipped with uh, services that we that we have developed that to do some basic commands such as takeoff, landing, uh, going to a point X, Y, Z. Uh, this is done using the the, the high-level commander api of the crazy fly farmer that uh, as the name implies is an api that uh, does this as high level functions to uh, do some basic movements uh, and interfaces with the commanders of the the, the firmer uh, we also have some publishers uh, for the odometry attitude status that is uh, subscribed by the gui and the clouds and, and then we can uh, do some storage, data visualization, etc. Uh, aside from that, we also have a collision avoidance system on board of the maps. This is not done using a ROS2 or MicroRos at the moment because, the, as we know, there is no brokerless peer 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 to peer communication at the moment. Uh, aside from that, ground station, we have the, the GUI, as I said. We also have RBS visualization for um, for. Uh, for seeing the mission in real time. Uh, the communication with the micro ROS agent uses at the transport layer CRTP. We have uh, implemented a custom, uh, a custom uh, transport using the custom transport API. Uh, we will plan in the future to have, when it's stable, to release it as an open source package. Uh, and then we have integration, we use the integration service to do the one communication to the AWS where there's a, a node, a ROS2 node for mission planning, and as well as we use the AWS CloudWatch to do the dashboard visualization that you will see in the video demonstration that we have in the near the, the end of the presentation. Okay, so next, uh, as I said, we have a video demonstration for you guys today. Uh, it lasts about two minutes. It's a simple mission of a patrol surveillance of the arena that we have set up here at Capgemini. Uh, at, at the middle of that arena, an environmental alarm is triggered. Uh, by an environmental alarm, I mean uh, a request to, to make uh, air quality measurements. And then the, 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 the drone that is closer to that, to that, uh, that uh, set point provides does the, the alarm, does the sensor measurements, which are then relayed to the AWS cloud. Okay, so let's see the cool stuff, the video. Uh, here you can see our arena before I start the video. Uh, we have the two drones here. We have the, this black 3D printed uh, <laughs> uh, things that uh, are the set points of the patrol. 
and then here a, a red one that represents the alarm satellite. The, you, here you can see the absolute positioning system, which is based on a UWB. And then let's go see the video. So here I'm uh, creating the agents. You're gonna, uh, this is the RP's visualization, this is RQT GUI. Here I'm loading the waypoints that are the, the set points for the mission, for the patrolling. This is the algorithm mission planning. I will not go in depth here, but if you're curious, then send me an email or something and we can discuss it. Uh, yeah, the drones take off. They do their, their patrol. Then there's an alarm triggered here at the middle of the arena, which is this point. The one that is closest, which was this one, goes there and publishes the sensor measurements. We have, a, have a, an example later on that we can, can show this, work, this thing better. Here we have the, the collision avoidance system, which also, if you are interested, we will have a link to the, the paper that we published about it until the end of the presentation. And then it resumes the patrol. Here you can see the both, both the agents receiving the odometry data. And then when the map goes there, there's the it's receiving the sensor measurements. And then the the AWS CloudWatch dashboard. And then that's it. That's it, it uh, resumes the mission until uh, the command is given. We should be around here. <laughs> okay. So uh, after this video, we have the the, pro the project from my my colleague Diana, which uses mind control or a, a brain computer interface that was louder than I expected uh, to to interface with the drones, also using ROS two slash microROS. So if you want, uh, Diana. Uh Hello, uh, so this second project was for my master thesis. Um, it's a little bit different from what uh, Rui just presented. Uh, it involves something very innovative, uh, BCI, or Brain Computer Interfaces. Uh, these technologies have gained popularity due to their uh, increasing applicability in a wide variety of situations, uh, mostly for uh, research purposes. Among them, uh, we have the analysis of cognitive emotions through brain brainwave signals, and there are even some efforts uh, for the remote control of drones uh, by formulating, for example, mental commands. So, uh, since these vehicles, the drones, uh, are considered to be critical systems, uh, the operator who man manages these, uh, these drones should provide both uh, cautions and cyber control. The, the problem is that these uh, technologies, the, uh, the brain-computer interface, are, are directly linked to the emotional and cognitive states of the operator. So, for example, situation, uh, situations of anxiety uh, and distractions from the operator can actually influence the control of the drone and can provoke perhaps uh, the collision with objects that you cannot autonomously detect, for example. So uh, the main question here uh, is how to manage uh, these specific situations where the operator is stressed or distracted, uh, obviously while controlling a critical system such as a, as a drone. Uh, so for this purpose, we developed a decision-making system that allows uh, an operator of a drone to formulate and send mental commands, but only when he's in a suitable emotional state for it. So basically, we built a digital twin of the operator uh, with machine learning techniques uh, and that is capable of detecting multiple emotions, uh, both at the cognitive and visual levels, and all this in a real-time setting. Uh, 
Firstly, the, uh, this digital twin receives inputs from the brain-computer interface and classifies the cognitive emotional state. Uh, it will also receive inputs from a video camera and classifies the visual facial expressions in, a, in another emotional state. According with these classifications, a de uh, decision will be then uh, outputted. Lastly, we have used uh, ROS2 to establish a, establish a communication channel between this digital twin and the drone itself. A client node is created and connected to the, to the base station. And every time the digital twin outputs a new decision, the client node will be responsible to forward all necessary information and the server node to send instructions to be executed by the drone. Um, we group a, uh, grouped a set of positive and emotional state uh, and negative emotional states at the cognitive and visual levels, as you can see here in the first table. Uh, only when both predictions belong to the positive group, uh, the command is approved and then sent to the drone. Uh, now, uh, in the next slide, I will show a short preview of how this system works uh, and what I call the focus state. Okay. Okay, so we will see the arena here. We'll have a takeoff, which is manual. Uh, on the left corner, we will see the visual digital twin with my with the outputted um, visual emotion, and I I have the DBCI on my head, which is giving me the brain activity, and I'm also detecting my cognitive emotions. As you can see, I'm I'm sending only right commands here. In this case, and I'm only focused, okay? And now I'm doing a, a land which is also manual. Okay, okay. So uh, I started the presentation. I, I will I will finish it. I will talk about the, the, the future work and things that we have done. For you, please. Okay. Yes. So uh, for our future work, we want to start development with PX4, the autopilot that we, we know that uh, uh, the micro ROS team is also, also working on to, to make the bridge with, the, with this autopilot for outdoor drones. Uh, we also want to improve our custom agent implementation, our custom transport uh, for multiple drones at the, the same time. Right now, it's it's good enough to to for only one drug, but it will be in the future uh, a lot nicer. Uh, and uh, actually, we want to also share this this code with uh, with you guys, with the, our custom agent, and also an an app with uh, the service that uh, make a takeoff and and land and, and go to the basic service that we we who we talked about it in the in the slides of his presentation and uh, yes you you can yes, thank you <laughs> and uh, for the 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 works that we have done we have some some papers published about the the collision avoidance system that we talked about we have uh, this this first paper and the second one it's about the the project of the uh, the, the brain computer interface for for drone control and basically that's it I, I finished the presentation, and if you have any questions, you can contact us or, or just uh, open the microphone and, and, and say it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so... Thank you. Thank you for this great presentation. We are happy that you're actually driving adoption of these such interesting projects. Um, I was going to say, yes, please share your articles with us. Maybe if you can copy paste the, the link in the chat maybe we can okay, okay. take of a course. look at them of course. Um, now it's time for any comment or question something that you want to add to add yeah thank you very much for this great presentation you three uh, really interesting to see micros in such complex settings working um can you Explain a bit what you did on the agent. Um, what are the most difficult tasks to make it usable with multiple clients simultaneously? Uh, okay, so uh, the agent uh, we're basically doing is uh, we have built and linked uh, a C++ library for the CRTP communication, which is a radio communication. It, uh, you use a crazy radio, which is a USB dongle for the radio communication. 
we are still having some issues with the multiple client sites, not only because of the the micro raw side, but also uh, with uh, having shared access to the radio. We believe it's not uh, such a trivial task to mm -hmm. to give equal priority to all the the drone communication. But uh, yeah, that's it. We for the single, I think it's uh, rather simple to do it. But for the multiple, we are having some issues, and we plan on the future when it's more stable to release it as an open source package. Cool, thank you. Um, I have to say that I'm pretty impressed with the demo. It's super nice, and I, and I wanted to know. I have understood that you have services in the micro site that allows to set a point in the in the drone, so the drone will fly to that point. Yeah. But for example, have you tried that without uh, absolute positioning system? Uh, yeah, that's actually the, the high level commander API, which is the part of the critical firm firmware mm -hmm. that we, we use in the callback, supports mm -hmm. the both functionals, both with the absolute mm -hmm. and as well as the relative. With the estimator, yeah. There's a there's a, a flag that uh, says you want to use the absolute uh, absolute position or relative, mm -hmm. because you don't have an absolute positioning system, it's always relative. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, super nice. Uh, willing to see that code uh, published as open source yeah. because I would like to try this in the in the okay. office. Thank you very much. No problem. Okay, if there's not any further question, we can go with the second section of this embedded working group meeting, which is the panel discussion about uh, providing a CPPRP for MicroRoS and ROS2 support for Rust. I will leave Jan or Ralph to, from Bosch to lead this section. Yep, um, maybe I share my, my screen. Uh, damn it. Yeah, so maybe as a, as a recap, um, we have been approached by a couple of people to um, provide also a C++ uh, language support for RCLC. And um, so I, I um, put here under um, RCLC issues, um, a concept, how this could be done. Uh, essentially, I, I looked into the different features that need to be, um, or basically which are available in RCLCPP, like message type conversion, uh, callback function pointers, message data types, and and, and so on, and um, made a comparison what what would need to have be done. And uh, also created a small, let's say, ping pong uh, example in RCLC examples, kind of demonstrating what is possible. Just just to to, to wrap it up or to, to summarize, well, essentially, it is what what needs to be addressed is um, yeah the type support uh, currently um, yeah basically when when you are creating a C++ um, subscription. This is, uh, let's say, STD messages, uh, messages string, uh, which is different from C. And um, the, uh, the callback function itself, where you can use your, your internal state from, from a class or and, and you have more type safety, which you don't have in, in, in C. So um, so I would say, in, in essentially, it's uh, possible to, to write these kind of wrappers. You can, you can have a look at this. Um, uh, issue and comment there and what I would be interested because that's kind of uh, quite a lot of work uh, to do uh, I would like to understand uh, from you this is kind of, I would like to keep it as open as a panel discussion um, how how large your your interest is um, in um, developing your application in C++ essentially asking you know what is the benefit for you if you would have a C++ API maybe called uh, micro RCLCPP for your embedded um, applications, uh, but keep in mind, uh, you know, people are kind of thinking, okay, I have all, all my nice uh, C++ um, packages, and um, you know, it's very, it's tempting to think that I can just readily use it on a microcontroller. 
However, uh, you know, those packages heavily use SED containers and uh, with dynamic memory allocation. So this is something you would like to avoid um, on a microcontroller. So if you want to develop something in C++ on microcontroller, you probably don't, you probably will not be able to just con, you know, just to run your, your favorite package on the microcontroller. As a second thing that I wanted to, you know, this is a C++ thing. And I just to set the scene, um, you know, there's also uh, Rust, right? For for embedded devices, uh, which has its own uh, memory um, um, memory concept, so the developer doesn't have to uh, care about it. And lately, there are two uh, interfaces. First of all, uh, ROS to Rust, which um, you know is a little bit um, has been uh, started. Yeah quite uh, quite some some time ago a year ago or so and uh, currently only supports um, subscriptions and um, um, yeah subscription and, and publishers um, however this is um, developed by Steve and um, who also developed um, you know the, the interface for for Java and and some other language front ends for for ROS 2. And this is going to be um, a default um, uh, lang uh, language front end for, for ROS2. And lately, there was um, a release on ROS Discourse where they have uh, Rust R2R, they call it. And, and these are the kind of now two, um, uh, let's say, language front ends for Rust. And whereas um, to, uh, some weeks ago, there was by chance um, a telco where these, these guys met and Essentially, this, there are two, two APIs. One is more focusing on the Rust developer, which is kind of this interface, thinking more about this um, async functions and, uh, and the Rust API. And, and the other one is kind of more thinking, you know, people would have their callback and so on. But essentially, these two um, uh, APIs are going to converge into one, uh, probably into this uh, Rust to Rust. Um, and which also uses then the Colcon development uh, built environment and so on, where this one is kind of more, I think, was using CMake and so on. So um, I, I was just trying to, um, you know, give you, um, uh, let's say, inspiring um, inspiration. Um, you know, what we could do to make uh, MicroRoss more um, attractive to embedded developers. So one would be to go into C++. And it would be nice um, to get some feedback from you. Maybe in, in, in the chat, maybe just type, you know, I like C++ or I like Rust or, um, you know, maybe just give, give some feedback. Are you thinking about Rust already? Or would you, are you thinking about C++? So, so we get as a developer of, of MicroRoss some, some, some feedback of how valuable a different language front end would be for you. Yeah, with that being said, um, um, yeah. Mm, have yeah. you found something about uh, standard libraries for Rust in microcontrollers, Jan? Because sometimes, for example, with C++, we don't have lib C++ or something like that. And I, I don't know Rust, and I, I, have a, I have not developed anything embedded in Rust, but which is the status of, of those kind of things? We have the bare language, or, or we have a functionality from a standard library or something? um that i think we have to find out i have not looked into mm -hmm. um i have not developed something in rust for myself mm -hmm. but i think we can we can find that out how how okay. this uh, will will be done and you know as they advertise this can be done on embedded devices mm -hmm. then um there there's probably a way mm -hmm. okay. for that i will check that yeah i was just you know that um you know in in um um in the quest of you know, where I, I try to um, develop a concept for C++ is, um, you know, when when even, you know, DDS implementations are being developed in, 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 in Rust, um, why not go in that direction? So, yeah, it's always difficult to, to engage um, with, um, um, with the audience here, 
but maybe as as a, a attendee could you just maybe just type in maybe rust or c++ or just say no i'm happy with c so that we just get some feedback i mean c++ is a good you know that's where a lot of that happens i mean it'd be, i'd like a reason to look into rust <laughs> okay mm -hmm. for all the reasons mentioned right like the memory protection and there's other things that shows a advantage we just haven't had any reason to go down that path yet so we're we're still sticking with C++, but again, if there's a doorway, I'll open it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and um, if I could add to that, uh, so on our end, we use uh, C++ and raw serial. Um, so if we had, if we were ever going to port to micro ROS, it would be advantageous to have C++. Um, on the side, I guess I'm personally very interested in Rust, so uh, I would that just from my own personal interest, I, I'm kind of following this project and the the Rust to Rust project as well. So that would be very cool to see. But um, from our perspective, I think that C++ would be the go-to if we were to migrate to Rust too. Mm -hmm. So, so basically, you're saying you you would rather see, uh, let's say, rather uh, implement a use Rust for for let's say Rust serial or your projects that you are working on. Uh, do you mean like a like a Rust port for Rust serial? Mm -hmm. um, oh, C plus plus was a misunderstanding. Uh, oh yeah, so yeah, so on our current systems, we use uh, Rust serial, so that's just the C plus plus mm -hmm. library. Um, yes. So if we were going to migrate to ROS2, um, so using micro ROS, uh, we would probably stick with C++. A lot, okay, our, C++. a lot of our existing libraries are and drivers and whatnot are C++ based. Um, yeah. yeah. And and how how important? Um, um, I mean, typically in in the um, when using C++, you uses uh, you know standard um, containers. Right with uh, dynamic memory um, allocation um, underneath. Um, I mean, this this will 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 be a problem if you just you know take the the library as is and and put it on a microcontroller as um, you will have memory fragmentation. So that's um, you know one thing is you could have this language API, right? I mean, even now you can have your C++ um, application and just use uh, RCLC. So to say, um, whenever you have a, a subscription or um, a publisher and executor and all that stuff, so, so these um, functions in, in C and still have your C++, um, you know, all the, all the other stuff written in C++. And I just want to make uh, make the point that it's it's not just the, the C++ language API, but also the, the different um, way you develop your application and in, in the RCLC, Basically, we make sure that at least from the library side, we are we are allocating memory only in the startup phase, and at runtime there is no dynamic memory allocation, and that might not be the case if you're just using your let's say raw serial um, C++ um, or let's say in, in um, um, if if you're using um, your application um, with then replacement of raw serial, and I'm using um, micro ROS for that. Yeah, uh, and yeah, in our case, we we typically uh, would allocate all do di all dynamic allocations up front um, at startup, and then we would uh, we don't do any allocations after that point. Um, for like raw serial, I think it's a static buffer um, that you can set using a template arg, for example. Um, Um, in uh, my case, I'm more interested in uh, Rust API. It's like a personal interest. Um, we used to work with a different library of C++ that implemented, like use the XRC DDS underneath. And I really enjoyed the C library more than the C++. Like it, we had much more problems with C++ with, our, uh, run, with the memory allocations. Okay, any 
uh, also, I mean, uh, also later on, if you are, um, have any comments uh, or questions, you can uh, post that uh, in the in the issue directly. Uh, Ralph put it here, or it's uh, it's in the chat. So the RCLC issue. Um, uh, so so we know um, you know what the, uh, what concerns you might have, and uh, from from the design point. Um, yeah. yeah. You can also find the links in the in the meeting minutes. So either here from the chat of meeting minutes and, and Jan also linked his, his example of a super thin C++ API with this ping pong application where you can analyze um, the differences to standard was to um, in more detail. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Uh... We had some insights, uh, interesting insights this time from the attendees. And hopefully this topic will be posted in GitHub or maybe in Rose's course. And we can follow up. Um, if there's anything else to add, I would like to move uh, to the last part of this meeting. We've, we've got 15 minutes left. Um, here, Pablo will be summarizing, um, presenting, which are the major enhancements added in the last couple of months, basically. Mm -hmm. so, thank you, Pablo. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen and, and I'm going to talk briefly about the, the things that we have been doing during these months. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, we have almost ready the, the RCLC Actions API. You have here the, the pull request. Uh, we are we are doing an internal revision here in Proxima, and we are going to we want also our, our internal revision uh, in the Microsoft team. But in general, we have implemented a, a, an API very similar to what uh, RCLCPP offers with some callbacks in the action server side and in the action client side. Some of those callbacks are, are optional. For example, you can, you can call a, an action without having the feedback, something like that. Uh, but it, it requires a, a code revision. And if some of you are interested in, in testing it, we are really open to, to feedback and, and all the things. Uh, one thing related to, to this is that uh, actions are implemented also in, in RCL. And in the RCL implementation of the action, we have a lot of dynamic memory usage, for example, when receiving a, a goal in an action server. So we also have here in the, in the MicroRoS repo, uh, a pull request with some modifications on the on the RCL in order to to avoid this dynamic memory at least in in runtime at least when when the when the action server resides a, a goal and and things like that uh, of course uh, as usual in 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 configuration time the, there are dynamic allocation by the by the RCL a liar, but in runtime, I have tried to avoid that and, and put all the things in the static memory buffers that are configured at, at build time. Here you have, for example, the, the max wall handles that they are used to to be handled by by then with dynamic memory, and now you you can set here a, a static memory pool. Um, so if you are interested, try that and provide feedback. We have modified. This is a major uh, modification in the MicroOS RMW because we have add support for a QoS at MicroOS level. For example, that means that now when you set the lifespan of a subscription, uh, if the middleware receives a, a topic and you make the take, uh, you take the, that, that data after some the, the time that you have configured in the in the QoS. The RMW will clean, will have removed the, the the topic, so you can configure how how long will the the topics should be in the in the RMW buffers. Uh, we have changed a lot of things uh, regarding time handling and and session handling regarding XSDDS. This is a, a major 
a major revision of their NW code in, in MicroRoss. But the most interesting thing is that now the buffers in the internal buffers in the RMW have a timestamp. So uh, the RMW can handle how long will these topics live in, inside of it. Uh, we have made some serial framing optimizations regarding the that uh, framing IO uh, protocol that we have internally inside the, the XACDDS middleware. Uh, with this uh, framing framing approach, what we can achieve is to send XACDDS messages through a, a stream-oriented transport. For example, uh, a new airport, a serial port, or, or anything that is stream oriented we have found some some critical bugs and we have uh, modified the code in order to solve them and for example now you will you will find easier to to implement custom transport for example in, in the crazy flight case because now the, the the framing io library will ask the 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 lower level transport the amount of, of bytes that they require in some cases, for example, we have found the, the, that the internal buffer here asked the, the read uh, function for 41 bytes. And, in, and for example, XRCDDS hair bits are less than 41 bytes. So in the case that your, your reading function in, in the hardware does not have some kind of a, a stream or, or a packet uh, timeout, uh, you will the, 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 this callback will wait for, for the whole time. Now we have. We have prepared the library to ask just for for the for the the amount of byte that it needs. Uh, this this will is uh, implementing custom transport in in weird transport such as for example the crazy flight radio or or can with can open because you have a really small payload. So kind of interesting. This modification have been done in the in the client and in the in the agent side. Okay, uh, we have prepared some. APIs for setting the um, the creation and destruction timeouts at runtime. Uh, previously, we had this parameter as a configuration as a build time parameter. So you you can set how long will try the client to create, for example, a new publisher, and by default it it tries uh, for one second. But imagine that you don't have an agent available. So it will it will hang the the client uh, operation for for one second. With this timeout uh, API, you can set on fly uh, how long should the the the, the micros client wait until the agent um, notifies that the the DDS entity is created. I think that for some use case, this can be useful. Uh, we have optimized the the Hervit uh, protocol in XRCDDS between the client and the agent because we have found that in some cases uh, working with uh, embedded network stack uh, we have found that the, the the embedded part buffers are overflow by by the by the Hervit answers. So uh, with this um, patch, what we have done is that the agent will only answer to the last Hervit that the client have sent. In this case, if, uh, if the client sent uh, 10 Hervits and the agent receives 10 Hervits, it will not send 10 Agnax. It will send just the, the, the latest one. And this is enough, enough to, for, the, for the client to, to acknowledge the, the reliable communication. So this will improve uh, a lot the, the communication in, in, in some transports. OK, um, we have this video of uh, Azure RTOS uh, integration with MicroRoss. And here we are explaining how to create a, an Azure RTOS project and how to integrate the MicroRoss library in order to, to publish. Uh, if I remember well, we are doing this with the IoT uh, ST microelectronic IoT A board or something like that that has with Wi Fi and, and also uh, Azure RTOS provide the Wi Fi driver so you can have a, a a micros application running on, on, on network transport or Wi-Fi uh, and Azure RTS. Which else? Ah, okay. We have officially released the the 
the Remix as port for Micros. Uh, as you might know, might know, this is the the official board for Micros, and we have here the Micros uh, uh, E Square Studio, which is the IDE from Remix's component to integrate Micros in the in that tools. You have um, instructions here to configure all the things and, and run micros applications on top of ThreadX, FreeRTOS, or even in bare metal, and using a lot of transport because we support a USB, serial, and UDP over, over the FreeRTOS uh, network stack or UDP over the, the Azure RTOS uh, network stack. Uh, we also have here the um, continuous integration that is running on board. In the in the in the hardware loop in the in our office and it's running nightly. So if you if you want to test something, just open a pull request here, and it will run on a on an actual microOS board. And finally, we have had this RT thread uh, RTOS support for from one user from the community. I have not tested it, but this is on my to do list because I I have seen this RTOS. A couple of times in the in the past months, so I would like to 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 check that. This user have provided here some instructions and some integration with a uh, with an IDE, and I think that it can be interesting because, for example, they they claim that that, that they support more than 150 boards. So, if anyone have interest, here we have this this pull request, and and if. If you guys test this on on your own boards on in your own system, we can merge it in the in the official Microsoft tooling to to provide support to this new RTOS. So I think that this is all from my side. Thank you, Pablo. We have a question in the chat. Yeah. Uh -huh. Real time and change the nature of having a real and the agent means that real time. Um, it depends on where you run the agent because the agent is the micros agent is just a wrapper on top of a fast DDS and, and with some layers that understand the uh, XAC DDS protocol in order to, to handle the DDS entities and, and all, the, all these kind of things. And fast DDS can run, in fact, on, on real time operating systems such as, such as QNX or VXWorks. So if you build the Micros agent and configure the underneath fast DDS in order to use a um, real time operation, because they, the, the guys of, of fast DDS have a lot of tutorials on, on how to configure fast DDS for, for hard real time operation, you will have a, a Micros agent that is real time compliant. We don't, we don't have a, a use case for, for that, but I think that is completely possible. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Really good summary, Pablo. <laughs> um, let me check if there is any topic added in the Selenium section. No. no, we don't. So, well, we've reached the top of the hour. Um, I want to thank uh, everyone for attending, especially the speakers. Thank you for your contribution today. And also thank you, thank the attendees who provided insights that for us are really important. Uh, the recording of this meeting will be online soon. And the link also will be added to the meeting notes in case you need to check it back. So thank you and see you next month with more projects and new features.